19. Fear in the dark. Who's in the next room? Who? A figure wan, with a message to one in the air of something due. Shall I know him anon? Yea, he, and he brought such, and you'll know him anon. Thomas Hardy, who's in the next room? The holes certainly were rough. Just right for a lot of vagabonds like us, said Bigwig. There's a footnote. Bigwig's word was lesil, which I have rendered in various places in the story as wanderers, scratchers, vagabonds. A lessee is a rabbit living in the open without a hole. Solitary bucks and unmated rabbits who are wandering do this for quite long periods, especially in summer. Bucks do not usually make much in any case, although they will scratch shallow shelters or make use of existing holes where these are available. Real digging is done for the most part by does preparing for litters. But the exhausted and those who wander in strange country are not particular about their quarters. At least there was room for twelve rabbits, and the burrows were dry. Two of the runs, the ones among the thorn trees, led straight down to the burrows scooped out of the top of the chalk subsoil. Rabbits do not line their sleeping places, and a hard, almost rocky floor is uncomfortable for those not accustomed to it. The holes in the bank, however, had runs in the usual bow shape, leading down to the chalk and then curving up again to burrows with floors of trampled earth. There were no connecting passages, but the rabbits were too weary to care. They slept four to a burrow, snug and secure. Hazel remained awake for some time, licking Buckthorn's leg, which was stiff and tender. He was reassured to find no smell of infection, but all that he had ever heard about rats decided him to see that Buckthorn got a good deal of rest and was kept out of the dirt until the wound was better. That's the third one of us to get hurt. Still, all in all, things could have been far worse, he thought, as he fell asleep. The short June darkness slipped by in a few hours. The light returned early to the high down, but the rabbits did not stir. Well, after dawn, they were still sleeping, undisturbed in a silence deeper than they had ever known. Nowadays, among fields and woods, the noise level by day is high. Too high for some kinds of animals to tolerate. Few places are far from human noise. Cars, buses, motorcycles, tractors, lorries. The sound of a housing estate in the morning is audible a long way off. People who record birdsong generally do it very early, before six o'clock if they can. Soon after that, the invasion of distant noise in most woodland becomes too constant and too loud. During the last 50 years, the silence of much of the country has been destroyed. But here, on Watership Down, there floated up only faint traces of the daylight noise below. The sun was well up, though not yet as high as the down, when Hazel woke. With him in the burrow were Buckthorn, Fiver, and Pipkin. He was nearest to the mouth of the hole and did not wake them as he slipped up the run. Outside, he stopped to pass Raka and then hopped through the thorn patch to the open grass. Below, the country was covered with early morning mist, which was beginning to clear. Here and there, far off, were the shapes of trees and roofs, from which streamers of mist trailed down like broken waves pouring from rocks. The sky was cloudless and deep blue, darkening to mauve along the whole rim of the horizon. The wind had dropped, and the spiders had already gone well down into the grass. It was going to be a hot day. Hazel rambled about in the usual way of a rabbit feeding. Five or six slow, rocking hops through the grass, a pause to look round, sitting up with ears erect, then busy nibbling for a short time, followed by another move of a few yards. For the first time for many days, he felt relaxed and safe. He began to wonder whether they had much to learn about their new home. Fiverr was right, he thought. This is the place for us, but we shall need to get used to it, and the fewer mistakes we make, the better. I wonder what became of the rabbits who made these holes. Did they stop running, or did they just move away? If we could only find them, they could tell us a lot. At this moment, he saw a rabbit come rather hesitantly out of the hole furthest from himself. It was Blackberry. He, too, passed Raka, scratched himself, and then hopped into the full sunlight and combed his ears. As he began to feed, Hazel came up and fell in with him, nibbling among the grass tussocks and wandering on wherever his friend pleased. They came to a patch of milkwort, as blue as deep, a blue as deep as that of the sky. 
with long stems creeping through the grass and each minute flower spreading its two upper petals like wings. Blackberry sniffed at it, but the leaves were tough and unappetizing. What is this stuff, do you know, he asked. No, I don't, said Hazel. I've never seen it before. There's a lot we don't know, said Blackberry. About this place, I mean. The plants are new. The smells are new. We're going to need some new ideas ourselves. Well, you're the fellow for ideas, said Hazel. I never know anything until you tell me. But you go in front and take the risks first, answered Blackberry. We've all seen that. And now our journey's over, isn't it? This place is as safe as Fiverr said it would be. Nothing can get near us without our knowing. That is, as long as we can smell and see and hear. We can all do that. Not when we're asleep. And we can't see in the dark. It's bound to be dark at night, said Hazel, and rabbits have got to sleep. In the open? Well, we can go on using these holes if we want to, but I expect a good many will lie out. After all, you can't expect a bunch of bucks to dig. They might make a scrape or two, like that day after we came over the heather, but they won't do more than that. That's what I've been thinking about, said Blackberry. Those rabbits we left, cowslip and the rest, a lot of the things they did weren't natural to rabbits, pushing stones into the earth and carrying food underground and Frith knows what. The three of his lettuce was carried underground if it comes to that. Exactly. Don't you see they'd altered what rabbits do naturally because they thought they could do better? And if they altered their ways, so can we if we like. You say buck rabbits don't dig, nor they do, but they could if they wanted to. Suppose we had deep, comfortable burrows to sleep in to be out of bad weather and underground at night. Then we would be safe, and there's nothing to stop us having them, except that buck rabbits won't dig, not can't, won't. What's your idea then? Asked Hazel, half interested and half reluctant. Do you want us to try to turn these holes into a regular warren? No, these holes won't do. It's easy to see why they've been deserted. Only a little way down and you come to this hard white stuff that no one can dig. They must be bitterly cold in winter, but there's a wood just over the top of the hill. I got a glimpse of it last night when we came. Suppose we go up higher now, just you and I, and have a look at it. They ran uphill to the summit. The beach hanger lay some little way off to the southeast on the far side of a grassy track that ran along the ridge. There are some big trees there, said Blackberry. The roots must have broken up the ground pretty deep. We could dig holes and be as well off as ever we were in the old warren. But if Bigwig and the others won't dig or say they can't, well, it's bare and bleak here. That's why it's lonely and safe, of course, but when bad weather comes, we'll sh we shall be driven off the hills for sure. It never entered my head to try and make a lot of bucks dig regular holes, said Hazel thought doubtfully as they returned down the slope. Rabbit kittens need holes, of course, but do we? We were all born in a warren that was dug before our mothers were born, said Blackberry. We are used to holes, and not one of us has ever helped to dig one. And if ever there was a new one, who dug it? A doe. I'm quite sure myself that if we don't change our natural ways, we shan't be able to stay here very long. Somewhere else, perhaps, but not here. It'll mean a lot of work. Look, there's Bigwig come up now and some of the others with him. Why not put it to them and see what they say? During Sifflay, however, Hazel mentioned Blackberry's idea to no one but Fiverr. Later on, when most of the rabbits had finished feeding and were either playing in the grass or lying in the sunshine, he suggested that they might go across to the hangar, just to see what sort of wood it is. Bigwig and Silver agreed at once, and in the end, no one stayed behind. It was different from the meadow copses they had left behind. A narrow belt of trees, four or five hundred yards long, but barely fifty wide, a kind of windbreak common on the downs. It consisted almost entirely of well-grown beeches. The great, smooth trunks stood motionless in their green shade, the branches spreading flat, one above another in crisp, light, dappled tiers. Between the trees, the ground was open and offered hardly any cover. The rabbits were perplexed. They could not make out why the wood was so light and still, and why they could see so far between the trees. The continuous, gentle rustling of the beech leaves was unlike the sounds to be heard in a copse of nut bushes, oak, and silver birch. <clears throat> Moving uncertainly in and out along the edge of the hangar, they came to the northeast corner. 
Here there was a bank from which they looked out over the empty stretches of grass beyond. Fiverr, absurdly small beside the hulking bigwig, turned to Hazel with an air of happy confidence. I'm sure Blackberry's right, Hazel, he said. We ought to do our best to make some holes here. I'm ready to try, anyway. The others were taken aback. Pipkin, however, readily joined Hazel at the foot of the bank, and soon two or three more began scratching at the light soil. The digging was easy, and although they often broke off to feed or merely sit in the sun, before midday Hazel was out of sight and tunneling between the tree roots. The hangar might have had little or no undergrowth, but at least the branches gave cover from the sky, and kestrels, they soon realized, were common in this solitude. Although kestrels seldom prey on anything bigger than a rat, they will sometimes attack young rabbits. No doubt this is why most grown rabbits will not remain under a hovering kestrel. Before long, Acorn spotted one as it flew up from the south. He stamped and bolted into the trees, followed by the other rabbits who were in the open. They had not had long to come out and resume digging when they saw another, or perhaps the same one, hovering some way off, high over the very fields that they had crossed the previous morning. Hazel placed Buckthorn as a sentry while the day's haphazard work went on, and twice more during the afternoon the alarm was given. In the early evening they were disturbed by a horseman cantering along the ridge track that passed the north end of the wood. Otherwise they saw nothing larger than a pigeon all day. After the horseman had turned south near the summit of Watership and had disappeared in the distance, Hazel returned to the edge of the woods and looked out northward toward the bright, still fields and the dim pylon line stalking away in the distance north to King's Clare. The air was cooler, and the sun was beginning once more to reach the north escarpment. I think we've done enough, he, enough, he said, for today, anyway. I should like to go down to the bottom of the hill and find some really good grass. This stuff's all right in its way, but it's rather thin and dry. Does anyone feel like coming with me? Bigwig, Dandelion, and Speedwell were ready, but the others preferred to graze their way back to the thorn trees and go underground with the sun. Bigwig and Hazel picked the line that offered most cover, and with others following, set out on the four or five hundred yards to the foot of the hill. They met no trouble and were soon feeding in the grass at the edge of the wheat field, the very picture of rabbits in an evening landscape. Hazel, tired though he was, did not forget to look for somewhere to bolt if there should be an alarm. He was lucky enough to come upon a short length of old overgrown ditch, partly fallen in, and so heavily overhung with cow parsley and nettles that it was almost as shelter as a tunnel, <clears throat> and all four of them made sure that they could reach it quickly from the open. "'That'll be good enough at a pinch,' said Bigwig, munching clover and sniffing at the fallen bloom from a wayfaring tree. "'My goodness, we've learned a few things since we left the old warren, haven't we? More than we'd have learned in a lifetime back there. And digging!' It'll be flying next, I suppose. Have you noticed that this soil is quite different from the soil in the old warren? It smells differently, and it slides and falls quite differently, too. That reminds me, said Hazel. I meant to ask you. There was one thing at that terrible warren of cowslips that I admired very much. The great burrow. I'd like to copy it. It's a wonderful idea to have a place underground where everybody can be together, talk and tell stories and so on. What do you think? Could it be done? Bigwig considered. I know this, he said. If you make a burrow too big, the roof starts falling in. So you want a place like that. You'll have something to hold the roof up. What did Cowslip have? Tree roots. Well, there are those where we're digging. But are they the right sort? We'd better get Strawberry to tell us what he knows about the great burrow. But it may not be much. I'm sure he wasn't alive when it was dug. He may not be dead when it falls in either. That warren's thorn is an owl in daylight. He was wise to leave when he did. Twilight had fallen over the cornfield, for although long red rays still lit the upper down, the sun had set below. The uneven shadow of the hedge had faded and disappeared. There was a cool smell of moisture in approaching darkness. A cockchafer droned past. The grasshoppers had fallen silent. Owls will be out, said Bigwig. Let's go up again. At this moment, from out in the darkening field, there came the sound of a stamp on the ground. It was followed by another closer to them, and they caught a glimpse of a white tail. They both immediately ran to the ditch. Now that they had to use it in earnest, they found it even narrower than they had thought. There was just room to turn round at the far end, and as they did so, Speedwell and Dandelion tumbled in behind them. 
What is it? asked Hazel. What did you hear? There's something coming up the line of the hedge, replied Speedwell, an animal, making a lot of noise, too. Did you see it? No, and I couldn't smell it either. It's downwind, but I heard it plainly enough. I heard it, too, said Dandelion, something fairly big, as big as a rabbit, anyway, moving clumsily, but trying to keep concealed, or so it seemed to me. Umba? No, that we should have smelled, said Bigwig. Wind or no, from what you say, it sounds like a cat. I hope it's not a stoat. Oi, oi, umbly rare. What a nuisance. We'd better sit tight for a bit, but get ready to bolt if it spots us. They waited. Soon it grew dark. Only the faintest light came through the tangled summer growth above them. The far end of the ditch was so overgrown that they could not see out of it, but the place where they had come in showed as a patch of sky, an arc of very dark blue. As the time passed, a star crept out from among the overhanging grasses. It seemed to pulsate in a rhythm as faint and uneven as that of the wind. At length, Hazel turned his eyes away from watching it. "'Well, we can snatch some sleep here,' he said. "'The night's not cold. Whatever it was you heard, we'd better not risk going out.' "'Listen,' said Dandelion. "'What's that?' For a moment, Hazel could hear nothing. Then he caught a distant but clear sound." A kind of wailing or crying, wavering and intermittent. Although it did not sound like any sort of hunting call, it was so unnatural that it filled him with fear. As he listened, it ceased. What in Fred's name makes a noise like that, said Bigwig, his great fur cap hackling between his ears. A cat, said Speedwell, eyes wide. That's no cat said Bigwig, his lips drawn back in a stiff and unnatural grimace. That's no cat. Don't you know what it is? Your mother. He broke off. Then he said very low, Your mother told you, didn't she? No, cried Dandelion. No, it's some bird, some rat, wounded. Bigwig stood up. His back was arched and his head nodded on his stiffened neck. The black rabbit. In a place like this. Don't talk like that, said Hazel. He could feel himself trembling and braced his legs against the side of the narrow cut. Suddenly the noise sounded again, nearer, and now there could be no mistake. What they heard was the voice of a rabbit, but changed out of all recognition. It might have come from the cold spaces of the dark sky outside, so unearthly and desolate was the sound. At first there was only a wailing. Then, distinct and beyond mistaking, they heard, they all heard, words. Zorn! Zorn! Zorn means finished or destroyed in the sense of some terrible catastrophe, cried the dreadful squealing voice. All dead! Oh, Zorn! Dandelion whimpered. Bigwig was scuffling into the ground. Be quiet, said Hazel, and stop kicking that earth over me. I want to listen. At that moment, quite distinct, the voice cried, Flaily! Oh, Flaily! At this, all four rabbits felt the trance of utter panic. They grew rigid. Then Bigwig, his eyes set in a fixed glazed stare, began to jerk his way up the ditch toward the opening. You have to go, he muttered, so thickly that Hazel could hardly catch the words, you have to go when he calls you. Hazel felt so much frightened that he could no longer collect his wits. As on the riverbank, his surroundings became unreal and dreamlike. Who or what was calling Bigwig by name? How could any living creature in this place know his name? Only one idea remained to him. Bigwig must be prevented from going out, for he was helpless. He scrambled past him, pressing him against the side of the ditch. Stay where you are, he said, panting. Whatever sort of rabbit it is, I'm going to see for myself. Then his legs almost giving way beneath him, he pulled himself out into the open. For a few moments, he could see little or nothing, but the smells of dew and elder bloom were unchanged, and his nose brushed against cool grass blades. He sat up and looked about him. There was no creature nearby. Who's there, he said. 
There was silence, and he was about to speak again when the voice replied, Zorn! Oh, Zorn! It came from the hedge along the side of the field. Hazel turned toward the sound and in a few moments made out under a clump of hemlock the hunched shape of a rabbit. He approached it and said, Who are you? But there was no reply. As he hesitated, he heard a movement behind him. I'm here, Hazel, said Dandelion, in a kind of choking gasp. Together they went closer. The figure did not move as they came up. In the faint starlight, they both saw a rabbit as real as themselves. A rabbit in the last stages of exhaustion, its back legs trailing behind its flattened rump as though paralyzed. A rabbit that stared, white-eyed from one side to the other, seeing nothing, yet finding no respite from its fear, and then fell to licking wretchedly at one ripped and bloody ear that drooped across its face. A rabbit that suddenly cried and wailed as though and entreating the thousand to come from every quarter to rid it of a misery too terrible to be born. It was Captain Holly of the Sandalford Ausler.